Hey everyone, Dr. Keith here again. So today we're in this first conceptual chapter of valuing and storing information. We're going to introduce you guys to databases. So databases are a little bit different, actually quite a bit different from what you're used to simple data spreadsheets in something like Excel. There's a lot more to them that helps them to be much more um, useful and uh, manage larger and larger amounts of data. But what I want to do is explain specifically how they're useful to eliminate repeated and redundant data. So we're going to use a little case study here. Scroll down in my educator in this chapter all the way to the section on relational databases right here. Gold star data with questions and go ahead and download this file. Okay, open her up. Let's fit this screen. And here we have, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. All right, we have some human resources data. So this is a hypothetical company, Gold Star. Uh, we have a bunch of employees, fake social security numbers, the location, uh, oh, well, hold on, one thing at a time here, uh, names, salary, gender, performance. Uh, so this is some performance review given by a manager of some type, where they work out of and the information for that office, their position title, and how much education is required for that type of position. This isn't their actual education simply what's required to be a trainee and here's the salary range again this isn't their actual salary this is simply what is the, what the range is for that position their actual salary is over here so if you just look at this data where are the problems with redundancy well there's a few ways to understand this we've got some questions down here at the bottom that'll help uh, understand why we've got redundancy problems so let's say i want to give a pay increase to employee with this social security number take a look at the data and see if you can imagine any problem based on this data to doing that. So imagine a system that lets us look up an employee by their social security number and then add some pay, a percentage or an amount to it. All right, imagine some programming logic that says find employee 109-87-6543 and add 20% to her or his pay. What's the problem going to be? Well, let's find that employee. All right, uh, here. I just saw here it is right here Harold Foster shouldn't be a problem right we find the row with social security number 109 add to the pay well hold on we've got a data problem here the pay has been entered wrong it's 5TT00 there's going to be some error well that's a problem with poor data entry somebody messed that one up but that's not our only problem if we have some query we call it where we say give us the employee whose social security number is this what if we have another employee, Emily Wood, with the exact same social security number? Now, obviously, someone's made a mistake, right? And if this mistake's been made and there's two employees with the same social security number, we're going to accidentally give another person a 20% pay increase that we didn't mean to. So redundancy, two pieces of information. One of them has been obviously been entered incorrectly. All right, what is Harold Foster's, Harold Foster's current salary? Well, let's look that one up, too. Well, we pull it up. And here's where we have that salary error before. All right, what other questions might we want to ask of this data? Which number do I call to get in touch with Boston's office? Okay, so let's do a query that says return, um, find the row with the Boston op that where the location city equals Boston. Here it is right here, or here's one of them, and give us the phone number. Cool. But the problem we run into is we've got this employee at Boston, this employee at Boston, and this one and this one. Now, the issue is we have now two different phone numbers for the same Boston office. How can this be? Well, you might say that each employee can have different phone numbers. Well, the question just said, what's the phone number for the Boston office? It implies that there's only one. So it looks like maybe Boston updated their phone number, but someone came to the database and only changed it in two places and not in every place. How could you eliminate that problem? Well, if Boston was only listed one time somehow in the database, you could change it in only one place and not have to worry about making sure you've changed it everywhere. How do we solve some of these other problems? For example, Harold Foster. How do we make sure that we don't enter in the wrong salary or enter in uh, text for something that should be numeric? Well, we want to be able to have some sort of input validation that says you can't enter a number here unless it's a number, unless it actually is numeric. How do we solve the social security number problem? Well, we need some rule that says uh, you can't enter a number in here if it equals a number that's already in here somewhere. 
So each of these problems can be fixed with certain input validation rules, except this data redundancy problem, where we have to have, I, I've got to mention somewhere that Charles Kenneth belongs to Boston. So I can't, if I d eliminate and delete all of this data right here, now I've got empty space, wasted space right here for Sue Manon. Yeah, it solves a problem if I go through and delete this for every Boston employee. I solve that problem of making sure that I don't uh, that I don't forget to update all the phone numbers in every place, but I create a problem in that I now have wasted space. Now in a database, it's going to reserve the space required for every cell. That's the combination of a record and a column, or a field we call it in database term terms. Um, I'm going to have all this wasted space, and it's going to reserve it whether I use it or not. So I that's a problem. Let me undo that a few times. Let's answer some more questions here. So again, I'm going through reasons why an Excel spreadsheet is inadequate by itself to act as a database. So uh, if Jose Rodriguez leaves a company and his record is deleted, what problems might this cause? Okay, let's find Jose Rodriguez. Here he is. All right, let's delete Jose Rodriguez, delete. And now let's say I wanna find out uh, what is the pay range for regional managers? Oh, okay, no problem, let's find that position. Trainee manager, account rep, uh, wait a minute, Jose Rodriguez was our only regional manager. By deleting him when he left the company, I also deleted our only record of what a regional manager gets paid. So let's undo that. One more problem caused uh, by having all this data together. All right, how about this? What if Dave Webster transfers to the Chicago office? What problems could this cause? You can probably see where this is going by now. David Webster, I transferred him to Chicago. Let's take a look at the data. What problem am I going to have? Well, he's the only employee at the Salt Lake City office. So again, if I change him, that deletes my data for Salt Lake City. Um, what is the appropriate salary range for a trainee? Let's find trainees. Here's a couple of them. Salary range is 25 to 4. Oh, wait a minute. Here it says it's 18 to 25. Similar to my problem with the Boston office, someone's uh, phone number. Someone has changed the salary, salary range in one, but not every instance. Lastly, how many records would I have to change if the account rep title is changed to field rep? So we want to change account rep to field rep. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Anyway, in other words, I'm, instead of changing it once, I've got to change it every time this appears. So hopefully you can start to see the issues or problems when we have to add more and more data to a database with and uh, creating uh, redundant or repeated data. It creates all kinds of issues. So how do we fix this? We call this the problem, the, the process of normalizing data. Normalizing means eliminating redundancy. And we're not gonna go through all the different levels of normalization in a class like this. Um, if you go into accounting or information systems, that's something you'll definitely need to learn about. Uh, but we're going to talk about it in general terms and we're going to separate this out into three separate tables and show you how that eliminates redundancy. So it's already done for you. Click here on normalize data. We have now one table here for information about the employee. Now we've got everything we used to have plus a little more and I'll show you what it's for here. Still have their name, their actual salary, gender, their performance rating. Um, each name is listed once. But now what we have is a completely separate table for office where every office is listed once and only once and a separate table for position. Similarly, every position is listed only once. So what I need to do is find out uh, what Jennifer Adams maximum pay, potential pay is. So I find Jennifer Adams in this table. And I say, okay, well, how do I know what her position is? Well, I've added something here called a foreign key. Every table in a normalized relational database has a primary key. The primary key is a field that uniquely identifies every record in the database. Let's find the primary key for, I think I'm missing something, there we go. The primary key for the employee table is social security number. So a primary key has to be some piece of data that is not going to be the same for any two records. It's going to, you, that's what I mean by uniquely identify every record. Jennifer Adams will have a social security number which should be different from everybody else's as long as I'm entering them all correctly. So that uniquely identifies her and we can use that as the primary key. Now, sometimes there isn't a natural primary key. For example, if I come over here to the location table, um, are there two cities named Miami? Yeah, there's Miami in Florida and Miami in Ohio. 
So I can't use location city as my primary key because I could potentially have offices in, in two cities with the same name. Address, yeah, I might be able to use address as a primary key, but again, you can repeat the same address in multiple cities. So I can't use any of my existing data. Well, maybe phone number, um, but there's reasons why I also wouldn't want to use phone number. If I don't have a natural uh, field that I can use as a primary key, I'm going to have to create one. And as you'll learn later, we have special names for these. This is a semantic key because it's data that we already have to record that we can use as a primary key. This is an artificial key. Again, don't worry about memorizing those names now because we'll cover them again later in the book. But our artificial key is a field we had to create for the sole purpose of being a primary key, uniquely identifying every row, every record. That's why you hear of things called like customer ID or order ID. Those are pieces of data we have to create simply to identify records in a database. So what we do to match up uh, and to make sure we know where Jennifer Adams works is once we create that separate office or location table and we assign a primary key, we have to create a field over here, whoops, in the employee table that relates to the primary key in the office table. And we don't necessarily have to call it the same thing, but we have. Here we called it loc space ID. We called it loc space ID over here. Now the PK in parentheses, that's not actually part of the, the field name. It's just there to indicate that this is the primary key. Similarly over here, when we take this primary key out of this table and add it as a field in another table so that we can match up the data with that table, we call it a foreign key over here. And similarly, this parentheses FK parentheses is not part of the name. It's just there to identify that this is a foreign key. So notice now I can do the same thing with my uh, position ID. So I can see what position she is. This is a number four. It relates to number four down here. She's a trainee. But now you can see how we've eliminated that problem of not making the updates in every record because if the Chicago office phone number changes, or I can't remember which one we use in our example, I change it in one place and there's no issue or, or, or even opportunity for me to forget to change it in every place because there only is one place to change it. So it eliminates data, less data overall, no more wasted space. Now I did have to add one, uh, two new columns here, a new column here, and a new column here for the sole purpose of relating these tables together. But by eliminating the repeated use of this data and this data down here, I have more than saved enough room to make it worth our time. And I've eliminated all those possibilities for errors. And lastly, Databases store information a bit differently. Uh, if the data in a, in a field is going to be numeric and never have the possibility to be text, it actually takes up less space to store. I can specify this field as numeric and it requires less space. So if you remember back to the very first chapter in this book, we talked about, or sorry, second chapter in the book, we talk about how all data is stored as ones and zeros. So if you remember right, uh, to store the character A, let's see if I can take you back to that, right back here. To store the letter A, I need eight bits in a byte because A is, well, let me see if I can find that for you. No, where's my ones and zeros? Here we go. This section right here, if you're trying to remember what I'm talking about, increments of data storage. Because there's 95 to actually 100 plus possible characters on the keyboard, I need eight bits in a byte, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, to store all possible combinations of ones and zeros. Two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256 possible combinations of ones and zeros for eight bits. However, if I'm never gonna have any letters, if I'm never gonna have any characters, if I'm only ever gonna have numbers, how many bits do I need to store 10 possible numbers, 0 through 9? Well, let's find out. 2, 4, 8, 16. I only need 4 bits to represent all 10 possible numbers to get above that number 10. Therefore, back here, uh, I can create this field, and if I say this field is only ever going to have numbers in it, it takes up half the space for each character that these fields take. So in a database, anytime I can convert something to a number, in other words, I've converted all this to be represented by one number right there, and all this to be represented by one number right there, I've saved a ton of space. 
All right, so this is how we eliminate redundancy by creating, by normalizing data, by separating it out into separate tables with fields that indicate relationships between the database tables. Uh, if this was not enough for you, you'd like a little bit more help, the next video is going to go through a different example with order processing.